Welcome. Uh, this is the first Forever Employable Lessons Learned webinar, and I honestly could not be more excited um, to, to put you in the extremely capable hands of Katie and David, who will soon introduce themselves and say hello. Um, super, super excited. Just a couple words for me. So this is, um, folks, if you're just joining us, do feel free to say hello in the chat. Tell us where you're from. Always nice to see how far and wide people uh, uh, the, the distribution of these of these webinars can be. So, so thanks so much for coming from wherever you are. And it seems like um, there's folks here from the US, from uh, from South Africa, from Sri Lanka, I saw from the Iberian Peninsula, although the other end of it, when I'm in Barcelona, the, the other side. Um, super excited today because um, Katie and David uh, reached out to me. They said, hey, listen, we've been putting this stuff to work and we've got some questions about how to put some of these ideas in the book to work. And I said, well, let's talk about it and see, see what you guys did. And it was uh, fairly remarkable, honestly. I was really blown away by the level of effort and detail. And um, you'll see it here in a second in the, in the, the meticulous nature of the, the work that they've done. And so I was like, well, let's share this with other people because I feel like there's a tremendous value in doing that. Show other folks that this stuff is real, that it works, so you can put it into action and that it goes that way. And so um, we're going to, uh, I'm gonna let them do most of the driving, including uh, introduce themselves as well. They've got a mirror board. There's a mirror board link in the, uh, in the chat that uh, is in there as well. So feel free to join there. Katie's sharing her screen so you can see what we're doing in Miro as we move along. I will make, I wanna make one really quick plug. If you haven't already gotten the book, please do go pick up the book, Forever Employable at Amazon, or really anywhere that you can buy books online at this point, it's available. I will tell you two more really quick things. One, if you do buy the book or if you have bought the book and read it, I would be very, very grateful for a review, if you don't mind. Uh, on Amazon, reviews go a long way. And even though it seems like there's a lot of them on there, the more, the merrier it would be terrific. So that would be great, number one. And number two, I will urge you just actually yesterday, and the timing on this is very good, just yesterday, um, I did launch the, the new uh, Becoming Forever Employable program, which is a, a workshop designed to help walk you through and coach you through a lot of the stuff that you'll see uh, that, that Katie and David are taking the initiative to do on their own as well. And you'll find a link for that on my website at jeffgodhealth.com under the Forever Employable heading in the navigation. So please do check that out. That's brand new and fresh. And so with that, enough promo, let's get to the content. Um, David and Katie, please say hello to the folks. Tell them a little about yourselves and let's dive into this. Awesome, thanks Jeff. And hello everyone, far and near. It seems like we have a lot of folks from a lot of different places. Um, so I'll go first. My name is Katie Sandin, or as some of you may know, Katie Kemmer recently changed my name. Um, I'm a product manager at GE Healthcare. Um, I manage a small team of product managers that we're focused on managing the core components of the GE Healthcare website and the mobile experiences. So what does that mean? That's everything as far as how our users register, how they pay for things, so our payment engine, our notification service. My team manages those capabilities. Um, fun fact about me, you know, when I'm not doing product management for GE Healthcare, I love to run. I recently moved from Milwaukee, Wisconsin to Tampa, Florida, and I'm loving the fact that I can run year, year long outside in the sun and don't have to trench through the snow. So that's where you can find me. And they're still, and they're still allowing you to go outside in Florida. They are. Yes, yes. There are no rules now in Florida. Um, so it's pretty much a free for all. Um, but yeah, hitting the track hard. Excellent, excellent. David? Uh, hi, David, everyone. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Uh, my name is David O'Malley. Uh, thanks for leading us off, Katie, and thanks, Jeff, for hosting us. So, um, as the title says here, I am uh, the Senior Director for Product Strategy at GE Healthcare. And so, um, you know, in the same vein as what Katie said, what does that mean? We're really trying to make a shift from being a project waterfall oriented type company towards being a more user-centric product management type company. And we're, I'm the one who is leading the charge in that direction. I, I get to work an awful lot with Katie in that regard. Um, she's definitely one of our best, uh, without a doubt, in leading product management here at GE Healthcare. And most, I've been at GE for five years, but most of it's been in the transformation space. It's been cloud transformation, agile transformation, and now 
product management, which is where I've been uh, for a large part of my career. And again, I live in Connecticut. I, um, as my um, uh, as my bio says there, I, I married up. Uh, I have two amazing girls who uh, always keep me honest. And a uh, little bit of a fun fact. So you hear about these people who are spending all of their COVID time focusing on their houses. I've turned into that guy. Um, I've, I'm redoing floors, painting, you name it. And um, actually getting kind of good at it, which is scary. New forever employable potential. <laughs> uh, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> Terrific. Awesome. Go ahead, Katie. I was saying, so that's us. Um, you can see we added um, our Twitter handles or LinkedIn uh, URLs. Feel free to follow us. We'd love to, to meet you and hear your feedback based on today's presentation. So I think next, um, David's going to tell us a little, we actually, pause, we want to know more about you. So you started to chat about um, where you're from in the chat, but it's always more fun to make this interactive. Um, so if you can come in the Miro board, use a post-it on the side here, if you need to add a new one, if you're new to Miro, there's a left-hand panel here where you can add new post-its. But let us know where you're from, what your motivation is for wanting to be forever employable, and what you're hoping to take away from today's session. And we're gonna do our best to, to touch on these as we go throughout the presentation, again, to make sure that we're not just talking at you and that we're encompassing what you want us to cover. Absolutely, and if any ideas come up as well, and, and for some reason either uh, you can't access the mirror board or you wanna get your question asked, there's a and a box in Zoom. It's at the bottom of the interface, it says Q&A, just click that and you can type your questions in there and I'll be, uh, I will ask uh, Katie and David those questions as the opportunities come up for us to discuss those as well. But do, do definitely feel free to use the mirror board as well for that. And so uh, just a, a programming note on, on the mural board, we did bring, I, I just brought everybody over to where my cursor is uh, right now and do that again. Uh, yeah, you know, so it's, there's a little section that says, tell us about you. Um, don't worry, um, you know, uh, we, can, we can go through that. If you've never used mural before, there's all sorts of bugs I'm sure you'll run into, but uh, we'll come back to that a little later and we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about it. But in that interest, in that vein, I think what we want to do is we want to move on to our answers and we'll be able to come back uh, here. So me, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, I reside in Norwalk, Connecticut, which is about one hour north of New York City. And I'm in, Victor I was originally from Victoria, Minnesota. Like I uh, said, moved from Milwaukee. So it was Minnesota, Milwaukee, and I progressively got warmer and ended up in Tampa. I, however, have spent more than half my life in Connecticut, but as you can tell from the accent, I'm not originally from these parts. Um, from the north side of Dublin uh, is where I would call home. And so um, I think, you know, when we talk about it, we're asking you what your motivation to be uh, forever employable is. Um, you know, mine, and I think what you'll get a little bit is the differences that Katie and I approach this on, even though we're using very similar formats or the similar framework to go through this. I have been what you would call in transition three times in my career, and I've, I've been in the game for quite some time. And not all of these have been your traditional layoffs. Some of them has been because an exit, uh, an exit occurred, a company was bought, and, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a positive thing. But, but really, I think I've learned over time, and especially with what we've gone through here in COVID, is that that could happen at any time. And I've seen what it's like to be in that situation when you have a game plan and you have a network to rely on, and when you have not. And the former is a much better place to be. And then I put, for the next one, I really put next. For me, it's, it's really about what's the next evolution of my career and you know where are we going where am i going to next where are we going to next and i think it's about exploring that awesome so on my end um, i've worked at ge my whole career so far i started as an intern and then i went into one of their leadership programs and i'm now a product manager at the company so a little bit different from david's story but for me i know that as i continue to progress in my career i want to always be working on something that i'm passionate about and I think, Jeff, in the beginning of your book, when you highlighted that the further you got up, the bigger the target on your back. And it was kind of this realization that, hey, where does this end? Where does this start? I felt that. And I got a little scared when I read the first chapter of your book. I'm glad I continued and didn't stop. 
But for me, it's about, you know, I recognize in that moment that my network is really limited to the people at GE and they're amazing people and they're wonderful, but how do I start to get outside of, of that sphere and expand my, my network? Yeah, and look, and I think that that's that's it's really important. I think there's there's it's, it's funny. I lived in New York City in the suburbs of New York City for so long, working in design and product management and in tech. And after a while, you go to the meetups and you go to the conferences and you go to the happy hours and whatever it is, and you feel like you you know everybody in in New York City tech, even in New York City. And then one day somebody shows up and they're like, oh, I've, I've been working in Citibank for 25 years as a design manager. And you're like, I've never heard of you. Right. And I think that these like that was a, a safe path up until kind of the last, say, five or six, maybe five, six, seven years. I think these days to, to really kind of trust that your 20 year career inside inside a bank without that network is um, I, I think it's risky. It's and unnecessarily so, as, as you both are demonstrating. No, I couldn't agree more. So I'm excited to be doing this and hopefully to meet some more people in the process. So I know David, the next one, right, as far as what we're hoping to give in today's session, um, kind of looking at the board on the left, um, we definitely want to show you the framework that we used. It sounds like Jeff's got an awesome um, course that he's launching, but kind of share with you what we did, what worked, what didn't work so well, and also um, just give confidence in the process uh, David and I will talk about how we went in not really knowing where this would end up and it worked like things happened to me and I've gotten new <laughs> mentees that I have. Um, I'm starting to get feedback on content I'm sharing and all of that felt like a big, oh, I don't know, in the beginning. And yet here we are today and I feel a lot more confident. So hopefully you'll get some confidence in hearing that story. What do you, what do you concur? Great, so I think David, next we'll talk about a little bit about the approach we took and how we got to Forever Employable. Yeah, absolutely, thanks. And you know, it's, so I think it's it's important um, to understand that, that Katie and I have known each other for quite some time. We've had a very good mentor-mentor relationship over a number of years. And it's it's evolved, of course, as all mentor relationships do. Um, we, we met each other in, I don't know where, probably far-flung part of the world. Yeah, and Germany you know something yeah it was uh look it's it's uh we've we've we both learned a lot um from each other i i like to feel over time i certainly know i've learned an awful lot from katie so when we one of our mentoring sessions we we talk about what's pertinent at a particular time and, and this came up so we deliberately sat down and we ran uh, a sailboat exercise for example we should expand it out a little further, but I'll give you the bookends of this. We ran a sailboat exercise. We talked about, you know, what was good about our current brands, what's good about our, our current positions. And as you can see here, there's, look, there's a lot. I mean, you, you go inside GE and you ask about the two of us and we're known, people know us. We, we've gotten out there. We've been highlighted in, in, the, in the, uh, the various mechanisms that exist within GE and, you know, I think there's uh, there's a lot of uniqueness in there. Um, but I think what, you know, there were certain elements that we felt were holding us back from specifically going out and expanding our reach beyond GE. And, and, and many of you can maybe can relate to this. I don't think that we're unique in this. So we talked about not knowing where to start. We talked about uh, neither of us are in big tech hubs. We're not in San Francisco. Um, we're not, you know, in one of those uh, large areas, you know, time was a big one, but I also think risk and fear. I mean, the idea that we would put ourselves out there, and no one would listen. Um, it, it's very comfortable to be inside your own ecosystem of which GE, by the way, is a massive one, 300,000 people spans the globe. So you could, you could spend your career here, like Jeff just discussed with his, um, contact in Citibank. You could do that if you wanted. So we deliberately needed to, to talk about what was holding us back from expanding beyond GE. And we came up with a couple of, of questions um, if we move down there a little bit, Katie, because you know from here, we asked ourselves in traditional design thinking way, how might we? How might we get past our fear, fears, MVP our brand experience? And so Jeff talks in the book about 
don't quit your job and then do it. You know, work on this while you're still employed. Um, we obviously had to fit this into demanding weeks, which GE um, is a demanding company. And we really have then had to understand who we were and expand beyond our local market. And that we had already done this. We had this, this discussion when somehow, I don't know, I came across Jeff's uh, Forever Employable book. Uh, I read it, or at least I started reading it, and I was like, Katie, I think we got our How Might We's answered here. <laughs> or at least we have a framework for being able to, to do these. And that's when we discussed it and we went into a process of, um, of using that framework to bring us forward. And I'll let Katie, um, who is our process maven here at GE, um, talk about how we structured that. So hang on, but before we jump into that, can I, let me ask yeah. a couple of clarifying questions about the how might we think. So specifically, mm -hmm. it says get past our fears, right? So look, um, let's talk about, let's dig into that for just a second, because like, what were those fears? What were those concerned, concerns that, um, that motivated you to head down this path, right? So in the book, the, the opening story in the book is me waking up on my 35th birthday in, in a cold sweat panicked that I'm going to end up being old and too expensive and unemployable in a very short amount of time and not able to feed my family. Basically, that's to me, those, those were the fears. And then, and then, right. And then getting out there um, and then putting yourself out there for me was, was, was interesting because what, what am I going to talk about? Right. So can you give us a sense from, from both of your perspectives, I'd love to hear, um, what were what are some of these, these fears that you're wondering about how to get past? For me, yeah, I mean, it was definitely a fear of a little bit of imposter syndrome. I, like I said, started my career, I've only been at GE, fell in love with product management and have done a lot of reading on my own and trying to apply it to my company. And while in my company, I'm well known for product management, we're all on the same page at GE that we're on a journey and we're not experts at it yet. And so there was a sense of, well, if I'm working at a company where this isn't our bread and butter, who is one I gonna, gonna wanna listen to me and how I've done things? Is, is what I have to say valuable? Do I know what I'm talking about? Um, and so there was definitely an element of that as well as I think just sounding dumb. <laughs> um, yeah. I remember the first time in this, so actually uh, in full disclosure, the first time I ever posted on LinkedIn was while I did this course. So I'd been on LinkedIn. I'd obviously spoken to recruiters and whatnot, gotten asked a bunch of times, connected with people, but I'd never actually posted. Now, I'm also not a huge Facebook, Instagram poster. I, a little bit here and there, but I'm not someone who posts every minute of every day. So it was kind of scary to go out there and be like, are people going to like this? Are they going to comment on it, like it? Um, so yeah, so that was kind of some of my fears. It's just having my message resonate and having it be a value where people would want to hear and listen to me. Oh, I, I, I recently, a lot of what you said in your forward or in your early um, parts of your book, Jeff, resonated an awful lot with me. And maybe this is just, you know, sort of immigrant syndrome here to the United States of where you kind of feel like, you know, you're only as good as your last ham sandwich and you can be, you know, uh, you know, a starving dog on the side of the road tomorrow. And, you know, I think um, it, it's, so definitely I will put that as a driver. That was a driver to always make sure that you're staying current and you're staying, you know, on, on the front edge of things. But definitely I would say when it comes to the fear, you know, my dad used to tell me, he says, intelligent people doubt themselves. Um, unintelligent people are just sure. <laughs> and I don't know, maybe, maybe that resonates with something that's happening on a geopolitical level. You're all from around the world. Maybe it reminds you of someone, I don't know. But, you know, I think definitely when Katie starts talking about the imposter syndrome, I think that's a lot of us, you know, we, we self-analyze ourselves about that. And you, there is an element, I think we, we certainly felt there is an element of you've got to go all in and put yourself out there and by doing that, then you are opening yourself up for others to judge you in some manner. And I think in the beginning, certainly, I'm not sure if we're still there, but I think in the beginning, um, that was definitely a mental hurdle that we had to get over. Yeah, and look, I can tell you from my perspective, just having now kind of been at this for a dozen years or so, 
Um, it never really goes away, that, that imposter syndrome or that fear. I mean, like I, I told you, I launched this, this program, this, this ed education program this week. And I was literally, I mean, I, and I was telling this in front to my wife a, a, about an hour ago and my, my, my daughters just come home from school. I've got teenage, teenage kids. And I said, you know, in front of them, I said, look, I said, this thing launched and I, I hope it works. Right. And, and not, nothing kind of nothing, not, nothing fires up that imposter syndrome when you're putting a new idea out there. Even like, and, it, and it could be something like a new product, like a program. It could be a or a post on LinkedIn or an idea or, you know, uh, a thought you had in the shower and you want to put it out there and see what happens. But it, it definitely you, I still get those butterflies every single time. So I, I hear you on that. I mean, look forward to it. never goes away. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, at least not for me. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, it's true. The same goes for, I mean, like anything, right? Racing. I get nervous every time before I race, no matter how many times I do it. Um, but I remember afterwards that I love it. So it's worth it in the end. Absolutely. Cool. Excellent. That's, I just want to dig into that a little bit because I think a lot of folks feel that way. I think a lot of folks, mm -hmm. like there's things like, you know, that how do I fit this into my life is definitely, is definitely a concern. And that's going to be interesting to see how you've done that as well. Both of yeah. you, um, you know, but but it's like it, it's this this idea of putting yourself out there, and and starting to share what what you believe is your experience and your expertise, right? And and believing that it, it has value, and I think that's that's the riskiest part because, um, well, it's it's you know what if somebody doesn't like it, right? Is what if you know, or what if what if nobody likes it? Like literally, like clicks that like button. And so, so I, I totally get that. And so I'd love to hear kind of how you moved, yeah. how you started taking steps to, to move forward from that as well. Awesome, good segue. So um, these were the four components of the Forever Employable Workbook. If you've read the book, they hopefully look familiar. They're on Jeff's website. Um, but we looked at this and like David said, one of our how might we's was, how do we fit it into a busy schedule where we're working 11, 12 hours a day, David's got kids that keep him busy. Um, me, not so much yet, but there's plenty of other things going on. Uh, so we looked at it and we said, okay, what if we were to complete one, I'll call each of these a component or one canvas per week. And so that's what we did. We met every Friday and we talked about the progress. We challenged each other. We looked at what each other had written, asked questions, and it really helped go through the process in a way where we were getting feedback throughout the journey, just like you do if you're developing software in an iterative fashion. And we were able to take the feedback from each other, the examples from each other, and apply that to the next uh, component. Hey, hey those meetings so on Friday, yeah. sorry, those meetings on Friday, yeah. were, were they like at lunch, before They work? were around lunch. Yeah, we're both in the Eastern time zone. Um, so it was yeah. kind of, for me, it ended up being kind of that last actual meeting before I typically end up just clearing shop, trying to get everything ready before the weekend. So. It was nice in the sense that I think at, at GE, at least for me, um, Fridays tend to be less meeting heavy. Mm -hmm. um, so it's easy where the time didn't get rescheduled too often. If you're booking yeah. earlier in the week, I think both of us have proved case in point that we're always oh, suggesting new times as things come up. So Fridays seem to stick really well. I think it's um, Fridays are, you know, the rest of the world is shut down by around about noon. Yeah. which is where a large part of our meetings always are, uh, you know, between India and Europe. But I think, I think it's important to understand, and to your point, we didn't treat, we treated this as, as work, as professional mm -hmm. development between the two of us. We didn't treat this as a, as a sort of a side thing. Um, I think this, the feeling is that this makes us better as people, which makes us better as employees, no matter what happens. Yeah. And therefore, you know, at a time, I think, when a lot of organizations are, you know, using this time to, to talk about remaining laser focused on what business objectives there are, we recognize, everyone recognizes that we're losing the focus on people and developing people. So we treated this as an important part of personal and professional development, which we know will stand to both us and our organizations as we move forward. The other thing, look, I, I, I want to call out, I just want to kind of highlight some things as you're sharing your story, because I think um, it's important to call this out. So look, making time to do this, treating it as real work is really important. And, and, and look, I love the buddy system, 
that you've developed here. If you didn't grow up in the U.S., the buddy system might not be as much of a, a, a thing in your collective psyche. But you know, when you when if you grew up in the U.S., right, you go on a, a trip with school, you always had a buddy. That way, you like held hands with your buddy, you never get lost, right? But this idea of, of having somebody somebody to help you stay accountable, right? Every Friday, I meet with David, right, and I've got to have something to show him, or he's going to make fun of me. Right, or, or something along those lines. Go the way around. It's the other right. way around. I was, I was, I was chasing after Katie. That was. That was very right. yeah. And so, and so again, th there's th these are these are tips and tricks to make this happen, right? So if you know that your life is hectic and that life is going to get in the way, maybe having kind of that regularly scheduled check-in with a buddy keeps that accountability moving forward, which I think is a really nice a nice uh, twist on this. Absolutely. No, definitely suggest it. Um, if you're anything like me, you can see I like process. I like lists. If it's not scheduled, it won't happen. So if I just, if I have someone, it's on the calendar, it will happen. Nice. Okay, so now the meat of it, which is talking about our journey and how we got here, basically the outcomes of, of doing this exercise. So I think, Jeff, we'll just kind of ping pong back and forth. Um, David, do you want to start? Or do you want me to start? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off because I know that you have a little more to, to talk about here. And, you know, I think really when when it came to the assumption canvas, you know, I think what we realized more, this was this was actually kind of hard. And again, for all of those reasons, we talk about, you know, doubting yourself or, or wondering what it is you have to give to the world. And, you know, Jeff called that out in his book is you have to be introspective. You have to talk about yourself first, you know. And this is really where we, we got very, I think we got very focused on what we are, what we actually are now, as opposed to aspirational about what we want to be. And I think from my perspective, I think that that was, um, that was, that was quite big. And then, you know, putting that in the context of what's going on in the world. So the idea of transformation, transformation in, in any sort, uh, digital, um, agile product, a lot of that has been accelerated now because of the situation that we came in, uh, that we find ourselves in. But, you know, so again, that was definitely helped me to focus on what are my core competencies? What do I feel that I could help anybody solve? And I think we even said it at one stage, Katie, is like, if, if you know, if uh, the speaker didn't turn up and you had to jump up there on stage and talk about something for half an hour, what would you talk about, right? And this is what I feel I could talk about and give, um, you know, new insights to in, in a pinch if I had to do that. Um, and so then, you know, then, then the rest of it really was, it forced us to sort of think about, well, how would we, who are the people we want to reach and, and how at a high level, do we want to be able to, to engage people, reach them and, and take our expertise and give it to them? Awesome. So yeah, as Dave, and I, I attest to this, if you need help in any of these areas, David is your guy through and through. Um, so for mine, I, when I looked at this, I, I actually started, my canvas actually looked like this. Um, because for me, I started just everything. Like, what problem do I help people solve? Well, okay, like I, I'm a runner and I, and I sprint specifically. I love to travel. I'm good at communication, I've been told. And so I just kind of listed everything under the sun. And I think that with the, the canvas, I found it a little challenging to fit it all on it with the different aspects. But what was cool in doing this is I, in walking through the exercise, saw very clearly where those key areas that I was passionate about and wanted to focus on. Because as I went through it, you can see that my thoughts trailed off and that I was like, eh, I don't really want to think about that anymore. But I wanted to think about the greens, the pinks, and the blues. And so that's what actually fed into my final assumption canvas. So for me, it was about applying modern product management principles to large corporations. I work at a very, very large company. As David said, we're going through a huge transformation. Um, and I also love to work out. Um, so I, I ran track in college. Um, and so I've continued to run as I've moved around. Um, so you can see some of my interests and problems I think I can help people solve are around that vein. 
Why, why didn't uh, cheesecake make it into this list, by the way? I noticed cheesecake. I know, I know. I was like, gosh, I think if I pursued that one, I'd get huge really fast. Right. <laughs> but no, I, yeah, cheesecake connoisseur, I love it. It was my Twitter handle for a while. And then I realized I was like, well, I'm not really talking about it. So maybe I should change it. But anyone who knows me and some of the people on this call do, um, the people at the Cheesecake Factory know who I am. I actually call it the factory, kind of like Beyonce. It just deserves one name. Um, <laughs> and so I go there quite a bit. Nice. So that was our assumption canvas. Um, we then took that and we did the audience mountain. And right. I think so, David, I'll, oh yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Any so, questions? So, just a little bit. So, so the idea here, right? So, so the workbook that that Katie and David are working through is the workbook that that I send you if you if you uh, if you buy the book and you send me your receipt, I, I'll send you this workbook, right? And so this, this this first exercise is really designed to get you to think critically about where to plant your flag, right? So where to kind of start the conversation, where to build your your platform, to build your to build to start to build that network, where you want to build reputation. And you know, I was joking about cheesecakes here, but 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 the the reality is like. The, the, the question is, what problem do you help people solve, right? What is the what is the root thing? And the natural thing to reach for is your job title. I'm a UX designer, I'm a product manager, I'm a, I'm a scrum master, I, I'm, I'm an accountant, whatever it is, but really starting to dig through for the underlying problems that you help people solve is, is, is the goal of this particular exercise because how you solve that problem is going to change over time, right? So today, right, um, you know, maybe you're doing design work and tomorrow you might be doing product management work and maybe you're doing sort of CEO leadership work in the future. My guess is that the, the core problem you're helping people solve probably stays the same, right? So how do you, how do you kind of increase the, the product centricity or the product ways of working, right, to large organizations, right? That's something that, that can be applied today as a product director or a product manager. It could be applied as a business unit uh, stakeholder or a leader, it could be applied as a CEO. It's a variety of ways to apply that. And really thinking through, right, in, in a very kind of design thinking way, okay, great, if this is the problem that I help solve, who do I help with that problem? And where do those people hang out, right? How do I actually start to reach those folks in a way that um, is, is um, natural to them, right? So you could, you could argue that tech folks hang out on Twitter, um, and LinkedIn, and so there's a lot of a lot of opportunity there. You could argue that maybe accountants don't necessarily hang out on Twitter as much. Maybe they do. I don't know. I don't know accountant Twitter, but it might exist, no. um, right? But they probably hang out somewhere else, and they probably consume content a, a, in a different way. How do you reach those folks? How do you find those folks? And then ultimately, I think the the thing I want you to think about as you're going through this particular canvas, and, and what I, I, I what David and Katie have done well here, is how will you know that you've reached those folks? Because again, generating the content is a start, right? It's, it's tweeting, it's publishing, it's maybe making a video, that type of thing. But really starting to see the change in behavior, the outcomes in that target audience is the key to really uh, understanding whether or not what you're doing is resonating, right? So, so like Katie says here in, in her canvas, right? People are liking it, they're sharing it, they're commenting on it. Um, they're asking her to come and talk about this topic. Hey, I see you keep talking about cheesecakes. I'm mean, not saying cheesecakes, but I'm kind of hung up on cheesecakes. It's almost dinner fun. time here, <laughs> right? And so, um, but no, I see, I see, I see you've, you, you've had a lot to contribute to the conversation about applying product principles at a large organization, right? We're facing the same challenge or we have this, there's this enterprise conference that's coming up and we need a speaker. Can you come do that, right? Mm -hmm. That is, is the behavior change that indicates to you that what you're doing is resonating. And to me, that's the key in thinking about this because all of us will say, well, okay, I did, I wrote the blog post, I'm out, right? I think, I think there's, I, yeah, I think there's an important part when we were getting here. I mean, you're obviously seeing the canvas after we've done it. I think Katie showed a little more uh, of, of her process um, at, at, that, that she went through. Um, you know, I think we we also I think it was Katie when it was when we were doing mine and and she gave you some good coaching on this. It's like, yeah, I do help people be more organized and I do help people be you know communicate better. And there's a lot of adjectives that you can put on there, but but you know you need the verb. Like, why why am I talking? Why are you listening to me? 
talk about this specifically. Anybody can talk about, you, know, you can pick up a hundred books and you can read about Agile, for example. Well, you know, so why would David O'Malley be up on a stage and, you know, uh, you know, talking about being agile? And, you know, as, I think as we get into this in a little bit, we will we, we kind of look at the fact that, you know, it's, it's agile in a certain context, right? Um, and so that was one of the things I think that, that we, we deliberately did and it, 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 it took a few iterations for us to get there. It's talking about the specific problem we help people solve, not the general problem we help people solve. Got it, good. Excellent. And just a, gen a just general reminder, if you do have questions for David and Katie, you can put them in the, uh, the Q&A box as well. And I'll be happy to ask them those questions in a little bit. Awesome, thanks, Jack. Mm -hmm. All right, so at this point, we have defined our assumptions. We know what problem we want to solve. We've thought about who we want to reach and how we'll do that. Now it's onto the mountain that is your audience. Um, so this is the audience mountain canvas where we thought about who are we going to um, reach out to from a free donor and patron and subscriber perspective? What makes them unique? How will we reach them? So I'll let David share his first. And let me let me just let me set the stage here again one more yeah, time. Please. So and so really quick. So audience mountain is is my attempt at um, reversing the conversation. This came from a conversation I had with Jeff Patton a few months ago, uh, reversing the idea of a funnel, right? So a funnel, a marketing funnel is the idea that you start up with a lot of people and you kind of work your way through. But I don't like the metaphor because everything comes through a funnel at the end. I like actually if you turn it upside down, it becomes a mountain. And your goal is to, is to start with everybody sort of at the bottom of the mountain, at the foot, at the base, and, and then to kind of try to convert them further and further up the mountain to get them to the top. And so if you think about building an audience and building a network and getting people to pay attention to you, well, at the base of the mountain is your free audience. Those are gonna be the people who, who, um, who, who don't uh, necessarily hire you or uh, for, for work or for, for speaking or, or, or writing or any of those types of things. And then, and then trying to, to move folks to build that audience to a point where people might actually pay you for, for some of that. So those, that becomes your donors and patrons. And then at some point, right, if you can build enough of a high value um, uh, content platform, then you've got these subscribers and these high value purchasers. How are you going to uh, uh, meet the needs of those folks uniquely? And so the goal, that's what we're looking here is, is there's three levels. Yeah, and I think um, and we had, um... We had some uh, when we when we get through yours, Katie. I think we you know we need a little bit of a reset on this. I think you actually see Katie uh, made some notes uh, in here on the side that helped us because we we were struggling. Obviously, free is is kind of easy, and then I think if you if you look up then high value purpose purchasers, that's kind of easy as well. We we did struggle a little bit in the middle, which we can discuss in a bit. So. Um, but even, even I think at this, was sort of the counterintuitive point is the give it away for free, right? Yeah. Um, which, is, which is always an interesting one. And, you know, and how much do you give away and what should you give away? We, we haven't really gotten to that yet. But this, uh, this did force us to break down the, you know, the, the people we want to reach and, and talk about what would we do regardless um, of whether someone was paying for it or not. And in this case, you know, you know, there's, you know, I've talked about the product transformation. There's a lot of people in project who want to get on that train and they want to go to go forward. So that's, um, I would expect those people would be in, you know, at least have their interest peaked. Um, at the other end, then you talk about the, the high level purchasers and I actually know some of these. And so it was easy to, um, to kind of put this together is, you know, the, the, the people who want to see the change created in their organizations, right? And, you know, for me, I, I think it was, was very much about talking about, when you talk about how to reach those folks, it's really through the power of networking, networking with others. And I think, you know, to get to the mountain idea that if you say it often enough in my head, I hope someone will say, you should talk to David, or you should, let me introduce you to, um, that's a bit, that's an untested hypothesis at this stage, but that is, that's where we went to. 
Um, and again, the donors and the patrons, I think was, was that little middle layer because it was a little hard to understand, but I didn't do it at this stage. It was a little hard to understand well, what would people pay for? Mm. And Katie and I talked about what does pay really mean? Does it mean dollars? Is it direct? Is it indirect? It, I, you know, we weren't 100% sure. And I think we, personally, I think I need to work out what that is, but, but there definitely was a middle layer between those folks who are just going to peruse and they're, they're, they're bombarded with a lot of information, and those who are all in and they want to purchase. And so that's where these folks came into um, in, in the middle layer. Yeah, and I think look, it's a really good discussion, right? I mean, is, is, are, they, are they paying me with money? That would, that would be nice, certainly. Um, but look, offering you a, a, a access to a stage, access to a platform, access to an audience, right? That's pretty good too, right? And so I think there's, there's a lot to be said about what, what does that actually mean if someone is, is at that middle layer, right? But you definitely want to, you, that, that's the, the person who can give you access, right? So the person who, who runs a conference or has got a popular podcast or something along those lines, um, certainly is is a different type of audience, perhaps, or a different than than the than the general free audience. Exactly. So as I went through it, um, I think, like David mentioned, having that understanding and see the notes of it on the side really helped me. And it it was surprising that that framework it, it did work for a non work aspect, right? Just like Jeff said, you could do it about anything. So maybe I'll spend a little bit more time on kind of the fitness one that I thought about. Um, so for my free audience, you know, thinking that this could be people that haven't yet found the right fitness program, or, um, you know, they, they just got hurt. And so they haven't had to figure out how to work out being hurt. So um, just didn't know, I, I tore my Achilles when I was 24 racing. Um, and so I had to deal with that. I was actually in the gym putting a weight wherever I felt like would work and just lifting something thinking I'd make progress. Um, so anyone who's been through that, I was like, I could be someone that you turn to. Um, and so that you maybe haven't found the right place yet, but you kind of check my stuff out. And the donors and patrons thinking that this is someone who's found the right community. Um, they're starting to see or feel results based on what I've put out there. And they're starting to maybe buy a class or pay for a onesie time versus the subscriber, which is when they fully get up the mountain and they're either purchasing something more long-term or I think a commonality David and I saw was this could be more corporation versus individual. So maybe I work with a company on a fitness plan for all of their employees versus just an individual. And I think you could also see that in a work environment, working with a company to improve their agility, their product management practices, versus the consumer level. Now, one thing to note here too is, is that all of these are assumptions, they're still assumptions, right? So we're sort of transplanting some of the ideas from the cannabis over here and thinking, thinking about them a bit more critically here, but these are gonna be your hypotheses, right? These are your hypotheses. So if we think about this as a product or a service that you're building, this is your hypothesis about um, who you're going to reach, how you're going to reach them, what you expect them to do when, if you reach them effectively. And then the idea is that we start to, ultimately we start to test these, and I, I don't wanna to get too far ahead of this, but, but the goal is to start to form these hypothesis statements out of this so that um, it really gives you a, a sense, not only of what is it that you wanna do, but how will you know that it worked, which I think is the key, because you, you can fill, you can fill canvases up with post-it notes with a lot of great ideas, but how will you know that it actually worked becomes interesting. Before we move on, David, there was a question in the chat that I wanted to point out to you because it, it was relevant to, I think, the, the, one of the last things that you said, um, and it was from Chet, and he said, look, I didn't fully understand the point you made about specific problems versus general problems. Can you explain that again? Yeah, I, I think, so Chet, I mean, you know, Katie and I, uh, as we were going through this, you know, talked about communication, for example, how uh, I, I can, the problem I can you know, help people solve is, I see so many people out there um, at my level, above my level, who, who present poorly. Um, they, don't, they, you know, they don't have the communication skills. They don't know how to get up on a stage and talk to people. 
so communication is something that you can say you help people um, solve a problem, but that's it's very broad. It's very general. Communicating what? Communicating writing, communicating speaking, um, videos. Uh, we we did a really um, great video. I'll, I'll post it in the link about the agile work, the accelerators we ran in New Orleans. And so, you know, how do you do that? For example, how do you? But that that is that's rather what we felt was generic. And we went through a few iterations and got into the specific about it's almost like a verb versus a noun really you know what is what is the action or the the outcome oriented items that i could really help people with help them solve that drive their own personal outcomes right they're a little more tangible and you see in here but i, I couldn't come up with better ways of putting like cracking product management you know, so that, that is actually, you know, it, it's a riddle, it's a mindset, it's something that you, you know, it's a change in perspective, which, it, you know, knocks over a whole bunch of dominoes that you then have to write in order to, to be good at that. And so I know what the answer to those things are. We've, we've been through that. Um, I've made the mistakes already, so you don't have to. So um, I, those, that's what I really talk about being specific as opposed to being general. I hope Chet, that, put, put something in, in, the, in the box there, Chet, and we can okay. come back to it if we need to. He did, yeah. Okay, he said he got it. Okay. Um, a, a couple, a couple of, um, one more question that came in. I think it's, it's important to kind of, and it, well, it leads us to the next conversation. So I think it's a good question to ask um, and, and kind of get your thoughts on it as you've been working through this. So uh, Yasif was asking, do we have to figure out all of this everything that you've done in, in Audience Mountain before running your first experiment? I think it's a great question. Um, for me, it actually is a great question because what I found in doing this is I was making assumptions. I was asking questions and kind of writing things down and not knowing. So one thing that we added actually to our exercise, so it wasn't a template, is we did do an assumption map. So as we went through this, I was making assumptions, right? I think I, I think large companies want to be more like the Facebooks, the Amazons of the world in terms of their customer focus and agility. I would assume that to be true based on what I know, but I can only speak for one company that I've worked with. So I started to document them as I was thinking about who I was reaching out to. And it was actually a really good segue into writing hypotheses because David and I mapped them on an impact as well as likely a likelihood scale, right? How impactful is that if we're wrong with that assumption? And what's the likelihood that I'll base a solution or do something based off of that assumption? And so what we did is we really focused our hypotheses on those assumptions and questions that had the highest impact if we were wrong and we were most likely to base something off of it. And so I think that really helped. Getting back to exactly what you asked, I personally, Jeff, curious to get your thoughts. I don't think it's wrong to do to test the hypotheses as you go through this. Um, but for me, it was something where I sat down, I just did it all, and made sure I noted the questions as I went. Yeah, no, I, look, I, th I think it depends on your level of patience, ultimately, right? But I think, look, if you come across if you come across a, f a couple of ideas that you feel are pretty good, and and you're targeting, um, you know an audience that you've researched or you've got a good sense of where to go. I, I don't think you have to figure everything out, right? I think what's interesting is that as you start to run these experiments, and I'm, I'm, I'm super curious to hear what you did there in a second, um, you will learn more information that will then kind of change the assumptions that you have in this in this audience mountain uh, exercise anyway, right? So you, you, can, you can lay it all out, but then as you start to actually execute on some of this stuff, inevitably it's gonna shift some of these things around. Maybe the thing that you thought you could get paid for no one's going to pay for, so it comes down. Maybe the the the, the person that you thought was going to be a high value subscriber uh, turns out uh, they they aren't. But but then but there's a donor or patron persona that really you think like all of a sudden that you didn't think that person would actually end up converting into a high value purchaser, but they end up doing that, right? So I think that the sooner that you can start to collect data, the better. But it does I think it does make sense to at least get a couple of solid ideas in the uh, in the canvas before moving forward, but not the, you don't have to do the whole thing. I think you go full waterfall on this. <laughs> I don't want to joke. 
Um, I, I think one of the interesting parts, though, is we we kind of we time box this, so we didn't really give ourselves a lot of time to overanalyze. Um, did you have something, Katie, when you did that assumption map? Did you have was it at this point that you actually tested one of those assumptions? Was it something around YouTube or something like that, or was that later? So I did do it later, but the question yeah. so. Um, as I went through this, right, I basically said anything that had high impact, high likelihood, I wanted to test that in a hypothesis. Yeah. And so you can see I put these stars on those ones and then I actually made sure that they were linked to a hypothesis. Um, so no, I didn't do it in the moment, um, but I definitely made sure I kept it in mind as I went forward. Maybe a good segue. David, do you want to yeah. talk about your hypotheses? Sure, absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think um, I didn't, I did, I also did an assumption map over on the right, but um, I, I will, I, I told most of what Katie did and, and added in just a few things there from a, a personal perspective. So uh, that was, you know, was, I think it's, I think that's actually a really um, a valuable thing to be able to add in here is just document your own personal assumptions. And I think it does help you move the ball forward a lot quicker. So um, on the hypotheses, I think it's uh, what's interesting here is, and I remember the first time I know that, you know, this is one of those ones, uh, like I, I, I came in here and Katie had about, you know, 40 hypotheses and I was struggling to get three. And I, I know that when I looked at this, and I'm looking at this in here um, very closely, so one of the things that was really interesting about this is, you know, the belief, what you believe you can do, right? So I, I, I think I was pretty okay on this, at least in the beginning. And then, you know, in a world for the particular patrons and donors, of course, it's, it's listed that way. When, when we got down to the second half, though, really started to talk about was I focusing on the donor and the patron or was I focusing on me? Like, so was the hypotheses my success or their success? And in the beginning, and I know again, we coached ourselves through this. I had very much, you know, I thought success would be, I would generate X number of links. I would generate, you know, X number of likes. And, and even Jet, you, I think it's you or, or it's uh, Josh who has, who has blogged an awful lot about product metrics versus product outcomes. Yes. And so my first attempt at this was very much metrics. I was writing down all of the things that I thought were successful. And then we had a conversation about it. And it was like, no, really, we need to start focusing in on something that is much more important for the consumer. Uh, and so that's where I think, uh, I, I think there is one. Yeah, I think that one you're focusing in on you know, in order to help them get promoted or acquire a senior product management role, right? Um, you know, the, the frameworks that I use for managing products um, is what they will use to, uh, to do that, to achieve that outcome. And then how I will know what's working, which is gonna be incredibly hard to test, will be when I see X number of people give me the feedback that, yeah, they did what I said, or they, they took what I said, they applied it, they got the kudos, and then somebody said, here you go, here's, here's the new role, you're now the expert. And um, I, can, I actually can tie this back to uh, one or two people um, already. And, and again, it's, you know, feedback is, is a difficult thing because it's, um, you know, it's, it's not as structured as a number. But, um, but yeah, I, I think that that was one of the, one of the big items that in going through these hypotheses, that was difficult to overcome and it, it took a little while. Yeah. One of the things too that I'll call out here as well is that um, with, with all this stuff, the more uh, specificity that you can put into this, the better, right? So as we talk about subscribers and high value purchasers, if you've got two or three different personas in there, you can always get a bit more specific with that as well, which I like. But look, there's, there's specific behavior changes that you're looking for here to tell you that you've actually succeeded, right? Engage me professionally from my direct experience. Two, two people do that, right? That's very, very important as well to, to get a sense of whether or not you're actually impacting people with the content as well, which is great. 
Um, there was one quick question in the comments. Um, as you're as you've been going through this, um, are you updating the audience mountain regularly? Which which of these kind of assumptions canvases are you updating regularly? And is the mountain one of them? I don't think because we we did this, it's been maybe a month ago. So we're not quite there yet where I'm changing the audience mountain too much. I would say we're still testing a lot of the hypotheses that we put forward, but would anticipate coming back to change it. Um, one interesting thing I learned, so I was, I made the hypothesis that um, if you were interested in fitness type content, the best form was YouTube, because that's what I had been using. So I posted to my Instagram and I, I did a poll and I actually found the majority of my friends were using um, either just running because of COVID, like they weren't using any content or Peloton is actually, as you know, has hit the, hit everywhere. Um, and so people were using that. So that was something that I would go back and change my audience mountain in terms of how do I reach my audience? Maybe YouTube isn't the right channel, which is what I was going to focus on. So um, that's one example. I don't think we've yet hit a cadence on how often we change it. It almost to me feels like as necessary as you either validate or disprove a hypothesis. Yeah, and look, I, I think, and you know, this, you're working individually, right? So there, there isn't that that sprint mentality where, okay, we take the team to a stopping point every two weeks or whatever it is, right? But you do have your weekly check-in with each other, which I think is nice, right? So it does, it does force a conversation. And if after a week or two, you're not making progress or something is stalled or it's not moving forward, you can you can nudge each other and be like you know what like we're gonna let that one go because you're clearly not moving mm -hmm. you're not moving forward with that and let's get you onto something more pr productive and I think that that's super helpful. So where do we go from here? So you got hypotheses. Where'd you go from there? Awesome, David. You just want to do your experiments to keep the flow, and then I'll do next. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you know, I think. Um, uh, I actually need to. I actually need to check whether or not these have been. Like I said, it's only been a couple of weeks, and we can actually talk about what what has actually transpired, even, um, which I think is, you know, um, you know, for me, it, it's you know, Katie just talked about polling um, those who who have mentored, and that's a that's a that's still something I need to actually run um, in order to validate some of that. Um, I, I will say that I think, you know, just on the initial foray, talking about those playbooks, if you see the experiment over on the right, it says number one, it's actually number two, is that, um, you know, just, just talking loosely to others around what that playbook is, the feedback I've gotten is, when's the book being written, which I, I'm... You know, audio book, maybe we'll talk about it, but written book, I, I'm not sure I have the discipline for that. But, um, but yeah, but definitely, I think in, in the few people that I've talked to with regards to testing this, it, you know, the, the thing that they come straight out with is it would be great to have an ABC of, of what to do with things. So um, I can't, I will be honest with you, I can't honestly say that I've taken a structured and disciplined approach to putting those experiments into place at this point in time. But I do, we did spend, I did spend quite a bit of time in actually going through them. And so I feel that just by planning those out, it gives me a sense of what is necessary in order to go forward with it. Yeah. I think the other thing, David, we talked a lot about, um, so kind of to this first one around people. Um, so I know you talked a lot to your members. So I'm one of them, I'm one of David's converts. So we met, like he said, um, I loved everything he was saying. It really made it feel like a startup within a very, very huge company like GE. And um, I got promoted as part of the process. Um, so I think it works. So while to David's point, we didn't necessarily like run this experiment full board um, through my feedback. I know he said feedback with other uh, mentees that he coaches. He's gotten some good feedback that this worked and it is true. One example um, for me, so I will go over here. Um, so I'm kind of the same, so the, the product content. Um, so I had a hypothesis that I could expose corporate product managers to more modern principles to help them approach problems differently. 
how do we move from outcome oriented or to outcome oriented versus solution feature factory to build trap all those phrases that we've come to hate. <laughs> um, so, so that was one of my hypotheses. The other one, and I think they're similar, is how do I help product managers, again, apply those modern product management principles in order to help them build the right solution for their customers and their organizations? Um, GE is a place, um, it's an awesome place, love to work here, but it's definitely a place where the stakeholders set the tone. They set the roadmap and it's a lot of thou shalt build this and then you go and build it. So as I've been reading, I've been really excited by other ways to think about that. I started to post on LinkedIn, did my first few posts on what I was reading, my thoughts. Um, you can see just kind of some of the stats. It's a lot of numbers here, but basically what I was really interested in is finding out if there was a need or gap, if the majority of our enterprise product managers needed this, and two, is there interest? So it was, is there a need and is, are there interest? And so by posting this, I found that a lot of people outside of GE Healthcare were liking it, were commenting on it, were reaching out. And that to me told me that it wasn't just a GE Healthcare problem, which is something I didn't know for sure, that it was a problem that had bigger roots and so that I could reach more people. Um, I also found there was interest. So I have two new mentees as part of this process. So I actually had people, they're both GE folks, but they reached out and said, hey, I noticed you've been posting on LinkedIn. Like they actually said this, I promise I didn't pay them to say this, um, but they're like, I'm interested in the content. Can we, can you mentor me? Can we talk every month? And I said, absolutely. So I was so excited. Um, I had other people reach out that I'd never met before and just wanted to talk. So like I said, um, this is the point where I say it works because I was really surprised at the people that were reaching out um, to prove these experiments and these hypotheses. Yeah, nice, nicely done. And again, look, I just want to call back right to, to the idea that the goal here in all of this is to create a, a continuous flow of inbound opportunities to you, right? So if we're creating a career safety net, if we're creating this, um, this uh, insurance that there, there's always sort of opportunities for you, some of those opportunities may be a new job, right? That may come. Some of those opportunities may be a, a paid speaking. And some of those opportunities are just going to be things that maybe you, you least expected, like, hey, will you mentor me, right? Now, again, that might not seem like, that might seem like just more, more unpaid work for you to do, right, it, 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 initially, right? But, but again, if you think about it, one of the things that I have found to be tremendously helpful is every opportunity that I get to teach. And mentoring is teaching. And so if you have an opportunity to, to teach somebody, somebody who's, who's read some of the stuff that you've published and he said, wow, I'd like to learn from you, then you actually, first of all, you're learning how to teach. And second of all, you're getting better at the craft itself because you have to figure out how to explain it to someone in a way that, that they get and that changes what they do at work and makes them more successful. And so ultimately you're improving yourself which then generates better content, which generates better opportunities. And so all of this is a virtuous cycle, even if some of the opportunities that are coming towards you don't initially seem like, well, this is gonna help me, um, you know, with like this, this it, it doesn't generate like immediate income, right? That type of thing. Awesome. So that's kind of uh, the end. We've got some other examples if you're interested, but. All in all, you know, we identified the hypotheses, we've been testing them, still in that process very much so. Um, but it's exciting, because like in one hand for me, this proved those hypotheses that people are interested. So I, um, I did a podcast episode for This Is Product Management, which will be coming out. If you follow me, you'll get to see it. Um, and I'm gonna try blogging, we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the journey. And so it's, it's just crazy to think about how about a month ago, I had never posted on LinkedIn. Um, I was really confined. While I was well-known at GE, I had never really reached out. And now I'm posting contents, doing webinars, and it's all been really exciting to see what's possible. Nice. Can I ask, so, so just a clarifying question. So you do, both of you took us through this process. Um, just, can you give us a timeline, like start to finish? And again, it's not finished, right? But from start to today, roughly speaking, how long has it have you said a month ago you didn't publish but how long ahead of that did you kind of do this do this work so the way we broke it up it was 
four weeks of work. Yeah. Um, I would say that testing the experiments, right, that has been taking a little bit longer, but I would say if you use this approach, it's a canvas a week and then the experiments however long you need. Yeah. So a month plus. David, same same timeline. You, you know, yeah, well, yeah, well, we were on the same timeline. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I, I think afterwards it, it comes down to what you can afford to give and and how extensive your experiments are. I mean, I think it's, I think that is also one of the other um, difficult parts, and it's it's personal. You know, what is happening in your life? Can you afford to give a certain amount of time to this? Um, I do with the the, I, the experiments are supposed to make you think about the least amount of work to do. Uh, in order to be successful at that. But um, I, I think, you know, I think some good examples are, and someone wrote in there about, did we test the riskiest hypotheses first? And I think um, certainly when you saw Katie's board, it definitely was like that. On, on a personal level, I think what was my riskiest one was, does anybody really care about GE anymore? You know, there's been a, you know, the, the, the stock's gone down, et cetera. It's, it's not one of the fangs, it's, uh, it's not one of these, but, you know, so that for me was a big hypothesis. And I, I was in the, if anyone was there, I think I saw someone was, the Miro distributed um, conference that was on last week. And, you know, I, we are strong users of Miro here at, at GE and myself and Katie have been using it for years now. And, you know, I remember saying to them, they invited me on. I was like, no, I want to speak. I want to know if something I've been thinking about uh, is actually going to resonate. And I have no idea how I'm going to measure it, but I'm going to do it. And, you know, so I created a new presentation and put it out there. And I said, this is from the perspective of General Electric. Mm. And that assumption, I think we knocked that out of the park. You know, everybody, you know, you've got very high ratings at the time. Uh, the people uh, from Miro that loved it. The, the, the associated LinkedIn um, posting that went up there was, again, I don't really put a lot on LinkedIn that way. It was really just a, um, just a sort of a recap and, and, and an image. And yeah, it, was, it, got, it got some great uh, feedback. So, so in that regard, I think that that's been a piece of confidence that yeah, no, no, people really do wanna know what a large company like ours is doing. Yeah. And uh, it's a good thing to build off. Um, there's a question, and I want to ask you a question. Just a couple more questions, and we can wrap this up in the next in the next few minutes. But um, um, there's a question in the in the Q and A box that I thought was interesting. I'd love to hear your takes on it from from people who have who have been doing this now. I, I've certainly got an opinion on it, but I don't like for opinions. Um, do you? <laughs> so the question is: Do you believe that forever employer principles are applicable to all areas? Imagine being an attorney, right? So, what, what do you what do you? What do you both think about that? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in at this. Um, I invited my sister here. Uh, she's in Ireland. She's an actor. Mm -hmm. And she's been in some, um, she's had some, some recent success. In fact, I'll, I'll post in one of her videos there in a moment. Um, and, and she also does yoga. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, I think like all starving artists, you know, there's, there's always something that needs to be, um, to be done and developed on the side. I, I'm not sure if she's here, but I invited the person who does my training as well, because she's also thinking about in a, in a COVID world, um, how to expand, you know, her gym is essentially shut down and, and developing an identity and a brand. And so I, I think definitely, if nothing else, I think the, you know, from that old adage, what is it? Plans are useless, but planning is essential. I think that this is a good system to run through, even if you came out at the end and said, nah, I got nothing. You know, or, or, or maybe you could turn around and say, well, what do I do? And maybe it's, you know, volunteer at the local community center or, or church or food bank or something. Maybe, maybe that's what you can offer. Uh, something that you feel passionate about. And, you know, when we start talking about the, how you, you know, donors and subscribers and the free and all that kind of thing, maybe that's not the monetary value, but it's the, it's the personal value that you get out of something. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think there's, there's currency there for you to be able to define on your own personal level. 
And yeah, I, I would say without knowing what an attorney does or, or, or what you know, part of law that you're in, because um, like in, in medicine, you can be in different parts of law. I, I think it's, I definitely think it's a, it's a good exercise to go through and to try. Even if you come out at the answer at the other end and you say, this isn't for me, you'll know. Yeah. Um, look, so I, I'm, I'm a strong believer that this, the answer here is yes. It's a resounding yes. I think that there are, uh, it's, as, 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 a, as an attorney, you have expertise, you have specialization, you have experience. There are lots of other attorneys out there. They're always, I mean, not, not, there's obviously the formal continuing education things that they have to do, but there's the informal um, education. There's, they're staying up, they're staying current. And there's guaranteed to be um, thought leadership in the legal community. And where that ultimately translates is, it, 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 you know, like this, this is one of those things where you end up being called in as, um, you know, as a commentator maybe on, on some legal cases, whether it's in the press or in the media, you can generate, um, you know, there's lots of examples of this on Twitter of, of, of legal, either attorneys or legal scholars or whatever it is who kind of weigh in on all the politics that's going on in the world today. And they're developing not only their own following and their own brand, but whether it's a monetizable newsletter or a book deal or something along those lines. And so generally speaking, I don't see any reason why an attorney couldn't be successful at this, or, or really most other professions. Um, I've got, um, there's, there's a question in the Q&A that I wanna ask you to, so I'm gonna ask you that one. And then I've got one other question I wanna ask you about your, or your employer as well, and how your employer feels about doing that. But I'm gonna save that one for doing this, but just for one second. There's a question in the Q&A box um, from Rupam. As you said, this took you four weeks to build. Is there a way to make it faster or is it slower but of more value compared to other design thinking methods? I think you could definitely go faster for David and I balancing work, life, everything else. This felt manageable. Um, one of the key risks or fears that we had going into it was, oh my gosh, like there's so much going on. I'm so like tanked by the end of the day. How do I put anything else into anything else? Um, and so that was the approach we took, but depending on how much time you have, you could definitely go faster. I don't think that there was um, a ton of like added value in having more time to noodle on it, um, as long as you have like that partner where you can bounce ideas off each other. Yeah, I think, um, you know, so Katie and I are, are big fans when pre-COVID of getting dozens of people in a room and, and using these tactile boards and, and working through things together. So I think we, we kind of built our professional relationship upon, upon getting to go it fast. You could do that. Um, I, I tend to think that four weeks coming in with no idea of, you know, to go from those how might we's that we had at the beginning which were all very, very big questions. And to be able to at least test those all in four weeks was, I think that I think that, that was a good amount of time, as Katie said, given what we had on our plates. And we, we do work for an employer that, that asks a lot of us, and I'm sure you all do as well. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm sure you can. I mean, maybe maybe you could actually do less and do it quicker and MVP that way. Um, so, you know, in in, in true agile, um, uh, you know, in the spirit of true agile, maybe maybe that's a better way of doing it. Um, we would love to hear that. Would love to hear what you've got done. Maybe just help to add. Um, I would say, Dave, I don't remember if we actually wrote it down or we talked about one of our exercises that we're like, okay, if we can give an hour like 60 to 90 minutes per week, that's doable, we can do it. So that's what we time boxed it. We each spent about yeah. that much time on each exercise. And then our meetings on Fridays were about 45 minutes long. Um, now, give or take, you know, the first 10 minutes was just catching up and, you know, shooting the breeze. But um, that's, if it helps, you can take those times and condense the timeline for what makes sense for you. So I've got one more question for you and then we'll see if there's any other, other questions from the from the audience and then, and then we can wrap this up. Um, question for you. So 
you, the interesting thing about this, and I get this question all the time, they'll, they'll say, well, your book's about me becoming self-employed. And I'll say, no, the book's not, not necessarily about that. Certainly you can, you can take the material in the book and, and, and head in that particular direction, but, um, but it can also help you in-house, so, which, your, which you're demonstrating, which I really, really love about the work that you, you're doing with this material. Um, how does your employer feel about you doing this? Yeah, so it's funny. Um, before, so like I mentioned, I, I recorded a podcast episode and I actually did reach out because I've, you know, you just hear the horror stories of people getting fired for, for things like that. So I reached out and um, our communications lead was fine with it so long as the messaging didn't taint the brand in, in, in a negative way. And I, you know, I told my boss about it as well. And I think he was excited about it just to the point you made, Jeff, that I've not only expanded my sphere of influence outside of GE, which is helping me get external ideas to bring back into the company, but I've also gained other mentees at the company and I'm helping them grow in their journey, which is helping GE be better. So in both of those scenarios, GE benefits as well in the sense that I'm meeting people and taking those ideas in and also helping coach people through the program. So to your earlier comment, um, you know, my plan as of now isn't to, to quit my job and do this full time. I'm curious to see where it goes, but I really just wanted to get myself out there. And I felt like this was a great way to do it and to also gain confidence in what I had to say. Yeah. And look, and, and David, I want, I want to hear your take on that too. I, but I, li I like the fact that you, looked, that you checked, right? So Corpcom uh, is important, especially in a large organization. Um, and so if, if you're concerned about it, ask for permission rather than forgiveness. I think there are folks out there who maybe trend towards the, 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 the opposite of that. But I think in a situation, especially if you've got a, a, an employer like, like GE, um, asking for permission is fine. And, and it's, I'm thrilled to hear that they're, they're okay with this and see the actual inherent value to the organization as, as well. Because I, I firmly believe that the organization wins if you win in this case. Yeah, I mean, you, you've, you've got to be careful. I mean, it, it's not acceptable for anybody in a large organization just to take what you do that could be considered IP in some manner right. and then just go and, you know, sell it on the outside. I mean, that's just that's just obvious. And we're a regulated company. So there are, I, I'm sure there's legal concerns that we don't even know about, but somebody does. Yeah, um, but yeah I think... Um, uh, Look, I mean, it's it's this idea that even as it just so happens, when I start talking about developing those uh, product managers, they were all developed internally. Now, a lot of them left GE. To be fair, GE left a lot of them. Um, but I, I think even just the fact that you are going through the process, even if you, you know, that that. High value purchaser is just as easily somebody inside the GE ecosystem in the five major businesses that we have. So, um, you know, I think by going through the process, by getting your thoughts a little more formalized, by finding out what your brand and what your niche is, then you can open yourself up to, you know, internal opportunities just as much as external opportunities. Amazing. Um, two more, actually, two more questions came in. So one, one quick one is easy one for me. I'll just knock it out, and then, and then one question for for you. And I'm happy to chime in on as well. Question from Rupam was: uh, Is this a follow up to Lean UX? Are we going to have a new book for that? Um, actually, uh, it's funny that you ask because I did sign on recently to write the third edition of Lean UX. So that'll be out next year. So Josh and I are working on that as we speak. So if you like Lean UX version one or version two, version three is coming out next year. So easy enough. This is not, you, you will find, you will find a lot of lean UX stuff in this book, it's just not applied to, to, to software products. Um, it'll be applied to, it's applied to career, professional development. So we're, we're talking about the same kind of stuff, assumptions, hypotheses, experiments. But I like this question here and um, we're gonna, we're gonna, this is gonna be the, the last question for today. Um, if you really wish to be self-employed and follow that path, how much time do you think that, do you do the three, do we all think that, that we may try, right? Imagine quitting your day job to pursue self-employment um, and within six months or a year, things are not going well. Is there a timeline for that? You guys, I, I have thoughts on this because I've done it, um, but I'm curious if, if you guys have any, any thoughts. Like if you were, how long, how long of a runway would you give yourself uh, on your own? 
David, your thoughts on that one? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I, I think timing is everything. And, and I've been on the receiving end of, you know, just having, uh, you know, give, getting the two week notice. Um, I, I've been on the receiving end of that for uh, a few times now. And, and like I said, you know, two occasions when it happened, you know, I wouldn't say I was prepared, but it, you know, the company, one of them was an exit. And so therefore there was, you know, a financial package that keeps you going. I, none of that matters, by the way, if you're losing your job, anybody who's unemployed, it's the worst occasion you're ever going to go through. You know, one of the worst outside of health reasons will be one of the worst experiences you go through. So I think, um, I don't also know if you could ever be prepared to be ready for that. I, you know, it, again, when I did it, um, or when it was done to me, I was a little more prepared and uh, or at least two of the occasions I was a little more prepared. I had zero downtime as far as um, sitting around looking for jobs. They actually were ready for me. Um, but I think, I, th I think doing an exercise like this, testing whether or not that's right for you, and then you, you really should be expecting, you know, you're not going to be working 52 weeks a year. So, I mean, you really should be sort of expecting the majority of the time that you are spending is creating way more hypotheses, way more experiments, and being in this kind of framework. Um, like that's your morning, noon, and night. And, and the delivery aspect of what you do will probably be an awful lot less of, uh, of, of your time than the preparation for that. So look, I mean, in my experience, is there a timeline? I think the timeline is based on your runway, right? So if you're, if you're going to strike out on your own, make sure you've got some sort of a safety net, financial, so let's be very clear, money, financial safety net to support you um, as you do that. One of the things that I did as I struck out on my own was knowing I was going to do it, I built a, uh, I call it a bridge gig, a kind of a gig that bridged me out of full-time employment into self-employment. So I, I kind of, I, I, I didn't, I didn't quit my full-time job until I had this, essentially it was a three month consulting engagement with, with, uh, with a startup. This was in New York city that I, I knew I had at least three months with them plus the runway I had had saved up, which gave me somewhere between nine and 12 months, depending on how many noodles we ate. <laughs> right, ultimately. And so I, I knew that I had that much runway. And, and look, not, nothing lights a fire <laughs> under you than watching that runway slowly disappear day after day after day. So the question from before was, can you make this faster? Yeah, you can, you can certainly work faster. And especially as that runway is starting to kind of disappear a little bit, it moves it forward. But, but for me, again, just given the fact that I really was, was concerned about, you know, providing for my family, that bridge gig really helped me out. So it was a consulting gig. It had a, it had an end. It was clear it wasn't going to be this thing that turns into a full time engagement, and that really made me feel a bit more comfortable about jumping out on my own. And then really, that really kind of lights the fire and keeps things going. So, in any case, folks, first of all, um, thank you so much for coming and for listening and for asking questions and for being involved in this discussion. Uh, that was amazing and terrific. Um, the recording will be available in the next couple of days, and I'll share it with the folks who signed up for the list. Uh, Katie and David, thank you so much. This was amazing. Not only were you super generous with uh, your work and your insights, but the effort that you put into to visualize your journey was tremendously valuable for, for me personally and for the folks uh, who attended as well. So thank you for doing that. Um, folks, if you don't already follow Katie and David on social media, please do on LinkedIn and on, on Twitter. Um, give them likes and comments. They're working hard to get them. So it would be amazing. Um, other than that, um, I hope you found this valuable. If you've got any feedback at all for myself, for Katie, for David, feel free to reach out directly to me. In fact, I'll, I'll put my email address in the chat right now if you don't already have it. Um, feel free to reach out and uh, say hello. Other than that, um, I'd say, you. Jeff, just in, in closing, I, I think one thing we will pay notice to is we, we're, my myself and Katie and I will definitely take a look at that mural board and the thoughts that you put up here. 
um, what you're hoping to take away from the session, your motivations. And, and I would say, you know, if there's anything you liked us uh, saying here today, if it's, if it's specific around that, um, by all means, keep us honest, push us and say, you know, connect with us and say, hey, how's that experiment going? And uh, I really, really would like to have seen that thing on, um, you know, staying healthy uh, and, and being a, a corporate athlete uh, um, as well as a, um, an actual athlete. Or I really wanted to learn more about product management. Um, you know, so follow us, prod us, poke us, and uh, we'll do our best to keep up with you all. This is, we, we think that, you know, you owning a part of the story is, is huge, um, not just for us, but we hope it's going to be for everyone who's here. If you all own this, we all own this together, I think we'll, we'll, come, out, we'll come out better. Terrific. All right, folks. Thank you all very much. Have a great rest of your day, wherever you are in the world. And uh, we'll talk to you soon, David and Katie. Thanks so much. Thank you. Cheers. Bye, Bye now. Everybody.